This is our league, and this is your league. From the 55-yard line on CFL America Radio and the Sports History Network. Time, in its passage, changes all things. One place, however, has sustained a spirit and a tradition for so long that its story has evolved into legend. Each autumn in South Bend, Indiana, the glory of yesteryear meets the challenge of today. The tradition of the fighting Irish of Notre Dame began nearly 100 years ago. The tradition is winning. Something Notre Dame has learned to do better than any other college football team. The important thing is to understand that all the great teams overcome adversity. We're going to have it in our life. We're going to have it sometime today. We're going to have it sometime next week. And you're going to have it the rest of your life, but you'll never achieve anything. Do we understand that adversity is what we look for? Because in adversity, there's opportunity. The spirit of Notre Dame is, I think, if it could be bottled, could probably light up the universe. Someday when the going gets tough and you want to win a game more than anything else in the world, tell that game to get it for the old gipper. 45, 19, 37, hip! Notre Dame's football teams have won more national championships and produced more Heisman Trophy winners than any other college. And pictures of their players and coaches line the walls of the Hall of Fame. Rockney, of course, would have to be singled out. I, I remember at the Rockney Memorial where our offices were, and I remember standing beside that bust there of him and putting my arm on the shoulder there saying, you started all this, and, and he did. We're going inside him. We're going outside him. Inside him, outside him. And when we get him on the run once, we're going to keep him on the run. Men of magic. Men of muscle. The men of Notre Dame. Wake up the echoes, cheering their names. All right, let's go, man. Come on. In 1842, Father Edward Soren founded the University of Notre Dame, and it wasn't long until the famed Golden Dome of Our Lady cast its first glint across the Indiana Plains. In 1887, Notre Dame was introduced to the game of football, and so began the most spirited romance in the history of sport. The romance was in the love of victory, the spirit in the way victory was pursued. In 1909, the spirit found a voice. 
cheer, cheer for old Notre Dame. Wake up, see that ghost, cheering her name. Then the ball Two students at Notre Dame, John Shea and his brother Michael, wrote a song that would become famous throughout the world. Cheer, cheer for old Notre Dame. Wake, Wake up, up the echoes, cheering her name. Send a volley cheer on high. Break down the thunder from the sky. Thunder was only a speed, great or small. Oh, no, today we'll win over While Notre Dame's band shook down the thunder, lightning struck in the unlikely form of a bandy-legged and balding undergraduate who was neither Irish nor Catholic. Newt Rothney was the immigrant son of a Norwegian carriage maker. At Notre Dame, he was not only an all-around athlete and scholar, but a talented drama student whose performance as an Indian squaw drew rave notices in the local papers. As an end on the 1913 varsity, Rockney and quarterback Gus Doré practiced the seldom used forward pass and then led Notre Dame to a stunning upset over the undefeated Army team at West Point. After he graduated magna cum laude, Rockney accepted a job as a college chemistry teacher. But in 1918, he was persuaded to become head football coach of Notre Dame. Upon this rock, a tradition was built. In the Kansas countryside, a stone monument marks the spot where a plane crash took the life of football's greatest coach. Newt Rockney left no epitaph, only memories and friends. You loved him. You loved him. You didn't like him. You just really loved him. You'd break your leg for him. You'd cut your neck right off right up there for him if he asked you to do it. On one, two, three. <laughs> Two, three. We had over 300 boys out for the freshman team, incidentally. In those days, there were no grant and aids or scholarships in, in, in football or athletics. And all these kids from all over the country wanted to play for Newt Rockney. He was the coach. There's been a lot of objection to spring football, and I, I object to it myself because I, I can see what interferes with your necking and drinking. But uh, I don't want anybody here to come out for spring football who don't want to. As a matter of fact, I don't want spring football unless you do. Now, uh, all those in favor of coming out for spring football, those who insist on having football, insist on having Hunk and Shav and Vadish and I, I take charge of this spring will all signify by saying aye. aye. Newt Rockney was the head coach at Notre Dame for 13 years. His teams won 105 games and lost only 12. No coach, past or present, college or pro, has ever matched his winning percentage. He always felt that football was not a game of muscle and brawn. It was a game of wit and intelligence. Now you go back to his teams, you'll find that most of his players were not very big. As an example, as a freshman, I weighed 220 pounds. I was the biggest player that Rockney ever had. But he relied on speed and techniques, his Notre Dame shift. Signal, 36, 49, 22, hip. One, two, three.
Rockne's players were always smart and agile, able to strike quickly from either side of the scrimmage line. <laughs> It isn't necessary to see a good tackle, you can hear it. Tackling requires leg drive, courage, and fine judgment of timing and distance, that's all. Rockney was a brilliant and entertaining teacher, and his lessons often went far beyond the fundamentals of football. Rock was not a Catholic, and he kept very close check on those boys who were Catholics. And if they didn't go to Mass and Communion every morning during the football season, as soon as they slipped up once or twice, Rock would have them right in his office. And he'd lay them down flat. After he got through talking with you, you could fall through a crack in a concrete floor and never scratch either ear on the way through. You've a fine ball game out there. But don't forget, it's just a game of football. And it's for now. And it's up to you fellas to get back in there and double up in your time and your classes so that you'll pass your semester examination. But the outside, let's not hold There were others coaching football who probably knew as much about the game as Rockney, but few had his knack for inspiring men. He was a clever psychologist who could fill a locker room with growls or with tears. We went down to play a great Georgia Tech team. They were undefeated that year, and we were the underdog. We were to get licked by 30 points. But Rockney came into the dressing room before the game with a great number of uh, telegrams in his right hand. And then he had a lone wire in his left hand. And he read this wire. He says, it's from my poor, sick little boy, Billy, who was critically ill in the hospital in South Bend. And then he read the wire as the lips began to tremble. The lump came to the throat. And he read, I want daddy's team to win. Well, we didn't let him finish his pep talk. We knocked him down. We went through a bolted door. We were got on the field about 20 minutes before game time, waiting for Georgia Tech to come out to give us that terrific licking. Well, they did physically. But when the game was over, Notre Dame had won 13 to 3 for Rockney and that poor, sick little boy, Billy. But when we got back to South Bend, there was a crowd of 5,000 people there to greet us. And as we walked down the long steps of the train, with our faces racked in pain, whom do you think we saw on the front lines? That poor, sick, a little boy, Billy, looking like an ad for a dairy product. And we were all basket cases. But he would do things like that. And uh, we knew that he was up to it. But he was such a convincing man that we believed him from one Saturday to another. No matter what he told us, that was the truth. It came from Rock, and Rock knew all things. But don't forget, man, we're going to get up on the run, we're going to go, 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 and we aren't going to stop until we go to that goal line. Don't forget, man, today is the day we're going to win. They can't lick us, and the black out of the goal. The first was let a man win there, and fight, 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 fight. What do you say, man? Rockney squad traveled from coast to coast, playing and defeating the best teams in the country. Stadiums were jammed with Notre Dame's Subway alumni, the name given to the thousands of fans who had never attended any college, but were attracted by the spirit of Newt Rockney's fighting life. you have done, you will occupy an immortal place in American history. He gave some speeches all over the country. He represented the Studebaker Corporation in their, in their uh, dealings in, in, in every part of the country. He, the Studebaker Corporation thought it was so good they came out with a car called Rockney. It was a lemon. 
In 1929, Rockne was stricken with phlebitis, but he continued to coach, leading his team to his fifth undefeated season and third national championship. By January of 1931, Rockne had recovered from his illness, and on March 31st, he took off for California to speak at a business convention. Just when his rule over college football seemed indestructible, he was gone. team carried him to his grave in a cemetery near his beloved university. It was like you'd lost somebody who was like your father or your grandfather who cared about you and you lose somebody like that and you never get over it. I don't think I ever go to a church that I don't rock, light a candle for rock. I mean that's 50 years ago and that's a lot of candles. All my life I have felt and I still feel that Rockne was one of the greatest men in the world. And whenever I had a tough decision to make, I would always look up and I'd say, Rock, what should I do? And I still do that today. Beneath a giant birch tree, where Father Soren once sat smoking a peace pipe with the Indians, rest the bones of Newt Rockne. spirit has yet to be buried. Use your old head, and I want you guys charging through as far as you can go. On every play. They expect to play right over you every time. And this all four pass, wait till you see the ball in the air. And then go and get it. And when they get it, boys, that's when you're going out there. That's when we go too. We're going inside them. We're going outside them. Inside them and outside them. And when we get them on the run once, we're going to keep them on the run. Then we run to the shop until we go to that goal line. Don't forget, man. Religion and football, they have always been linked at Notre Dame. I think it's a, a unifying factor, the, the religious aspect at Notre Dame. Uh, I went there as a non-Catholic. I'm not Irish either, but I got it, it really keyed into a whole different tradition, a different culture, if you will. And it was a melding pot for different nationalities and, and ethnicities and, and the religious aspect was a tie-in to all of those. It was a kind of a common bond factor that brought us all together. Religion has always been part of the mystique of Notre Dame. 31 counter. But it is the men who have created its legends. In 1956, Notre Dame won only two games. But the Heisman Trophy voters looked beneath the mountain of defeats and found a gem. The golden boy, Paul Horning. Horning number five led the Irish in scoring, passing, and punting, and finished second in the nation in total offense. If I would have had that same year at Southern Cal, Michigan, or any of your great schools, Ohio State, I wouldn't have been close in the Heisman Trophy. But I was the Notre Dame quarterback. And that's the only reason I won it, because I was at the university for a quarterback to be at Notre Dame. In 1924, Notre Dame had neither a reputation nor a golden boy, but they captured the country's imagination with an elusive, quick-striking quartet of running backs. After leading the Irish to a lopsided victory over Army, these four seniors were immortalized by the words of sports writer Grantland Rice. Outlined against a blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again today. In dramatic lore, they are known as death, pestilence, famine, and war. But in real life, their names are Stuart Rare, Miller, Crowley, and Lane. So when we 
got back to South Bend on uh, Monday when we went out to practice, uh, George Strickland, a uh, sports rider, uh, bought four horses out. We were in our football uniforms. He placed us on the horses and uh, sent that picture all over the country. I think he made a small fortune on it. He had it copyrighted. I don't think that any of us had ever been on a horse before, and uh, we were more frightened than the horses. The only trouble with uh, being one of the four horsemen, no matter what else you did, you were one of the four horsemen. I think if I was governor of the state, I'd be introduced as one of the four horsemen instead of the governor. Like the four horsemen, George Gipp is also an unforgettable part of the history of Notre Dame. In 1918, the Gipper was an All-American on Rockney's first team. And years later, when a movie was made of Rockney's life, Gip was portrayed as an honorable, outstanding young citizen who might one day grow up to be President of the United States. At least, that's the way the actor playing Gip's part interpreted the role. Well, Gip certainly was a coach's dream during a game, but during the week, he was a coach's nightmare. Gip was, was over at Mishawaka playing poker one time, and Gip got over late to practice. And as he came on the field, rocking out of the corner of his eye, saw him, and he said, Gip, if you can't get here on time, go back and take your uniform off. And Gip did just that. He took his uniform off and went back to the poker game. Everybody thought that Gip was, was greater than Rockney. He was a big man, and he deserved to be. He carried the ball most of the time. We did the blocking. Whenever he, he was in a critical situation, he always knew how to handle it. Near the end of his senior season, Gip was sidelined with a throat infection. And when the team played its final game at Michigan State, Gip remained in South Bend, dying of pneumonia. Everybody was heartbroken that he was so sick. The students, to a man, stood outside of his room, down in the house, uh, outside of the hospital. Most every student in the school, praying that he'd get better. It was, it was really an emotional time. With Coach Rockney at his bedside, the Gipper died on December 14, 1920, at the age of 25. Eight years later, as a twice-beaten and demoralized Notre Dame 11 prepared to play the undefeated cadets of West Point, Newt Rockney told the team about these final minutes at George Gipps' bedside. We were in the dressing room, still tense, quiet. Finally, Rock said, how many of you ever heard of George Gipp? Well, we all heard of George Gipp. One of the greatest players I ever coached. He died for Notre Dame. Here was this strong athlete, helpless in bed. And I said, George, what can I do? He said, Rock, he said, I, this is it. This is it. Oh, Rock said, George, you know, it can't be. It's, this can't be it. There must be something I can do for you. He said, no, Rock, he says, I think this is it. He said, I'll tell you what you could do for me, though, Rock. There's going to come a time when you're going to want a game more than anything else in the world. And that time comes. I want to tell you something. Tell that gang to get that for the old Gipper. The emotion. You can't believe the emotion in that dressing room. Then Rock said, what about it, boys? Go get him. Inspired by the ghostly spirit of George Gett, the Irish upset the Army 12-6. 
And as long as football is played at Notre Dame, there will never be a game as memorable as the one that was won for the Gepper. At Notre Dame, there are many impressive monuments to glory and several humble ones as well. At the campus fire hall in a second-story dormitory room, the course of Notre Dame football was plotted from 1941 to 1953. Here, a brilliant coach worked through the night instead of going home, staying close to the game and school that consumed his life. The coach's name was Frank Leahy. Leahy was a great coach, and some tried to compare him with Rockney. Rockney could beat teams, and they, he could make them like it. Didn't create any resentment. Leahy, on the other hand, when Leahy beat somebody they resented, they hated his guts. Frank Leahy is the kind of coach that you begin to respect more after you've left. But while you were participating in all of those daily football sessions while you were there, you sometimes had the feeling that this guy was the toughest taskmaster in the world. But Frank Leahy was the epitome, I thought, of what a coach should be. He's a guy that stressed uh, determination, dedication, self-sacrifice. He's the guy that said that anything worthwhile, you had to pay the price for. Uh, I love Frank Leahy, I really did. Uh, he, would, uh, uh, he would get more out of people he engendered great respect, and I think this is, again is back to where he wanted the same thing that Rockney engendered great respect. And I think the whole pattern was a Rockney-type philosophy. Rockney's philosophy dominated Leahy's life from the moment he arrived at Notre Dame in 1927 from Winter, South Dakota. Like any tough young Irish Catholic of the era, Leahy's dream was to play oh, no. for the Rock. Oh, too high, Metzger, too high. And you didn't get that man out there, Leahy. Get your head on the inside of him, Frank. Carry him out. Rockney taught Leahy the system and created a coach in his own image, preparing Leahy to claim his birthright. Notre Dame students welcome new football coach Frank Leahy. <laughs> Leahy, former Boston College coach, opens his first spring drill as... Boston Leahy swept out the old Notre Dame box in favor of a new formation which would feature an unknown reserve, Angelo Bertelli. So I was running about sixth string, and frankly, he decided that he needed someone to throw the forward pass, and overnight, I became a first stringer. I think, frankly, he was happy to see me, and I certainly was happy to see him, because it was the beginning of a modified T formation. It was time for a change at Notre Dame, away from the Notre Dame box, and into the T formation. With the T, Leahy lost only three games in three years, and Bertelli won the Heisman Trophy. It took a war to stop them. Sign of the times, Notre Dame players join the Marine Corps Reserve. Sports are important on the morale front, but the boys are also wishing to throw the axis for a loss. Bertelli was drafted right off the practice field, and Leahy followed close behind. The coach was commissioned a captain in the Navy, but some say he spent most of the next two years talking to servicemen with football eligibility remaining. By the time the war ended, Leahy was leading an awesome array of talent onto a different field of battle. His commander was the incomparable Johnny Lujak, a quarterback who fit Leahy's plan to a T. Jack won the Heisman in 1947, and two years later, it was Leon Hart's turn. Rugged number 82 led the way, and in four straight seasons, Leahy's post-war legions did not lose a game. Now, of those four years, we were national champions three. That meant that a whole uh, class of uh, Notre Dame students went through without seeing their football team lose a game. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes it gets to a, an attitude as you get towards the third and fourth years, not whether we're going to win the ball game, but how bad should we beat these fellows today? Notre Dame ruled the 40s, and Frank Leahy was the master. His one influence was unmistakable. He even sounded like Newt Rockman. So Frank had a way of saying to us before a game that he says, I'd rather have my left arm cut off up to here than to lose to this team that we were playing today. Then the next game, the right arm left left him and pretty soon his left leg and his right leg now this is about the eighth or ninth game of the season so he decided to take the whole team out to the notre dame cemetery so we were going to say a prayer over rockney's grave we went over to see who else was around there and there happened to be the basketball coach who had just died about three or four months prior to that and with that Leahy got up from his solemnity of praying and he happened to notice us over there and he says ah oh, lads Come away from there. Visit that man during the basketball season. And that's the kind of a guy, and he meant it. No, we accepted his manner of speech. In fact, we got a kick out of it. And I think any player that uh, played at that time under Leahy could, could uh, imitate the coach. And they could talk like Coach Leahy. Oh, Leon, how are you, my lad? Oh, Angelo, how are you? How's your mother and father? How's your girlfriend? Oh, lads, let's run that again. Oh, Jan Latner. Mm. Jan Latner, you should be in the Navy. You're a cruiser. When John Latner cruised onto campus in 1950, his impressive physical skills were matched by his unpredictability. Latner's style was thrill a minute. But Leahy was not impressed. Uh, I fumbled five times in one game. That's the only record I got left. And, and Leahy, being a perfectionist that he was, couldn't understand it. He couldn't understand why a back of my caliber uh, could make those many mistakes. He says, <clears throat> if you wouldn't mind, I I'd like to have you go over to one of the chapels here at the University of Notre Dame. <clears throat> and as you get into the chapel, John, uh, would you please go to confession and confess those five mortal sins you committed last Saturday? Leahy persuaded Latner to hold on to the ball more tightly, and number 14 became the Masters' fourth Heisman Award winner. While Leahy's teams in the 50s were good, they were no longer invincible. An average of two losses per season were more than this perfectionist could bear. In 1953, Leahy collapsed at the Georgia Tech game and received the last rites. He recovered, but refused to change. We tried to get him to take a vacation to get away from coaching. He wouldn't do that because he wanted to be the coach. He wanted to be another Rockney at Notre Dame. So his only thing he had in life was football, football, football. And that really hurt him, not only had physically. And he was cracking up, there was no question about that. At the age of 47, Frank Leahy resigned the only job he ever wanted. He was six times unbeaten, four times national champion. Although he lived 20 more years, Leahy never again coached the game he loved. Autumn afternoons in South Bend began to heat up on Friday. rallies before each home game give Subway alumni of all ages a chance to shake down the thunder. In the heat of such moments, Great rivalries ignite. Tomorrow, it doesn't take 10 blocks in offense. It takes 20 blocks in offense. Tomorrow, it doesn't take 10 tackles on defense. It takes 30 tackles on defense. But we beat Southern Cal. Yeah!
The greatest college rivalry of all is Notre Dame versus the University of Southern California. Since 1926, Trojan horses like O.J. Simpson have made this more than just another game. Eight times there have been national championships at stake. Southern Cal once exploded for 35 points in one quarter. And in 1972, number 28, Anthony Davis, scored six touchdowns. Notre Dame has kept pace with heroes of its own. In 1973, Eric Pennick burst through the October gloom for 85 yards to end Southern Cal's unbeaten streak at 23 and propel Notre Dame to a national championship. Then came the green jerseys. In 1977, Coach Dan Devine dressed his team in green and beat the favorite Trojans 49 to 19. Devine stayed with the lucky jerseys for the rest of the 1977 season and led Notre Dame on a wondrous journey to the national championship. But USC is not the only school to bring out Notre Dame's best. Army's long gray line symbolizes a series that stretches all the way back to 1913. The Black Knights of the Hudson and their fanatic support troops reached their peak in the 40s behind a bull named Doc Blanchard. Army coach Earl Blake turned not only to Blanchard, but also to Glenn Davis, number 41, a slimmer, quicker version of the same story. They were known as Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside. And when the world went to war, Blanchard and Davis stayed on campus as the backbone of an unbeatable team. In 1944 and 45, Army beat the service depleted Irish by a combined score of 107 to nothing. The two worst defeats in Notre Dame history. In 1946, it was time for revenge. Yankee Stadium and Army versus Notre Dame. Tickets sold out. For this is the greatest natural in football 77-year history. The Irish are snarling for revenge. Notre Dame football prestige is at stake. The ghost of Newt Rockney walks today. The men of Notre Dame had returned to stop Army in its tracks. But Johnny Lujak found the same rough going as the team's battle to a nothing-nothing stalemate. Only once was that stalemate threatened. Doc Blanchard, closely covered all day, finally shakes loose around end. He's clear except for one man, Lujak, who doesn't miss. That's that. The battle of the century is over. The most colossal nothing-to-nothing -nothing football game in history. Colossal games have always been part of Notre Dame's heritage. In a 1935 contest, unbeaten, unbeaten Dame roar back to score three times in the last two minutes for an 1813 victory. In 1957, Terry Brennan's team was a three-touchdown underdog to Oklahoma, and with a 7-0 victory, ended the longest winning streak in college history. But the most miraculous win came against Houston in the 1979 Cotton Bowl. Quarterback Joe Montana ignored below zero temperatures to score the game's first TD. But by halftime, the icy field had taken its toll. When we came in from halftime, uh, I just got the chills and couldn't stop shaking. And so they didn't let me go back out. My temperature was, I think, 96 at the time. You know, I remember drinking 
a cup of chicken soup and he was they had him in blankets and he was just shivering you know you could see him shivering and shaking and uh, you know no one no one thought he was going to be back out rechecked his temperature occasionally he was coming up gradually but the other problem was that as he was doing all this we were hearing crowd noise and as much as there was a home crowd we knew that wasn't for us so he heard that noise and he picked up the dish and just drank the rest of it right out of the bowl. Forgot the spoon. Montana returned with Houston leading 34 to 12. But the man with ice water in his veins led Notre Dame all the way back to a 35-34 victory as a bowl of chicken soup proudly took its place among Notre Dame's historical treasures. Reminders of the winning tradition are everywhere. Moses hopes for a high national ranking. Father Corby is better known as Fair Catch Corby. And the touchdown Jesus looms over Rockney Stadium where the gridiron is nurtured year round for just five Saturdays each fall. Since the stadium's dedication in 1930, Notre Dame has won over 90% of its games at home, except for a period following Frank Lay's retirement when the Irish legend stood still. Visiting teams rushed into South Bend eager for revenge, and in a five-year period, more games were lost than in the previous 20. With the fighting Irish down and out, Northwestern beat them four straight years behind a young coach named Ara Raul Parsegian. Finally, in 1964, Notre Dame solved this problem by hiring Parsegian as head coach. When I came in the first day to do the job, when I was now the head football coach and I drove up Notre Dame Avenue, I was going right in towards the Golden Dome. I remember a, sort of an electrical charge going up my back. I felt an enormous responsibility. And I assembled a, a very, very excellent staff. And we did make a lot of changes. Uh, we made changes where we thought it would best help our football team. And uh, it's also where we found John Hewitt, a guy who had never won a letter at the University of Notre Dame. Well, I started to watch him out there and saw this is a guy with great talent. Hewitt's favorite target was a former reserve running back named Jack Snow. And Parsegian's bargain basement passing combination set the stage for a remarkable turnaround. It was absolutely an electric season. It was electrifying just to go on the practice field because they realized an era, here is a guy that he knows his football. He's a dynamic, magnetic individual. Uh, we listen to him. We do what he tells us. We got a chance to win. With the same players who had lost seven games the year before, Ara Parsegian won nine. John Hewitt went from total obscurity to the Heisman Trophy, and Notre Dame hailed an Armenian Protestant as heir apparent to the Rockne Leahy legacy. I couldn't believe how they jammed people in. All this massive humanity, all those arms were coming out. We're number one, we're number one. It was a great thrill, and I remember standing up there and looking down, and I, and I said to myself, this is the way Hitler got started. The next decade was the era of Arrow. 95 wins and a return to glory for Notre Dame football. Parsegian put Notre Dame back on top, recruiting players who could live up to the Irish legend. In 1966, sophomore quarterback Terry Hanratty started his first varsity game, 
On national television against Purdue, Hanratty completed 13 passes to another sophomore, Jim Seymour, for 276 yards and three touchdowns. Hanratty was an instant star, or so he thought. I'm sitting down ready, to, you know, for the coaches to pat me on the back. And all of a sudden I hear, hand ready, that's terrible footwork. Hand ready, you didn't carry out your fake. Hand ready, you didn't do this. After the, the film session, I walked out and I said, I played terrible. Harris' philosophy was, okay, here we have a young kid who this could very quickly go to his head, and we've got a real problem on our hands. So they were going to knock me down the first game I played. And from then on, you realize that, hey, you know, it wasn't me, it was the whole team who did it. Terry Hanratty went on to break George Gipp's career offense record, which had stood for 48 seasons. Then Hanratty's mark fell to his successor, Joe Theismann, number seven. Theismann had quick feet, a rifle right arm, and a favorite receiver named Tom Gatewood. Like Hewart to Snow and Hanratty to Seymour, Theismann to Gatewood had a nice ring. He was a Baptist, I was a Methodist, we were at a Catholic university. From that level of communication, we had nothing in common, yet we found a language that we both related to, and we were successful. In the era of Ara, good players became great in the warmth of Parsegian's fire. You know, they talk about Newt Rockne's speeches before the game. They could not be better than Ara's. Because, you know, he's got that game plan in his hand, and he's pounding it in the other hand, going on and on. And you're ba-boom, 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 and you're ready to go out and play. Notre Dame was more than ready to play against Alabama in the 1973 Sugar Bowl. Both teams were undefeated, and the lead changed hands six times. The Irish held a one-point advantage late in the game when Parsegian decided to gamble from deep in his own territory. The gamble paid off as Tom Clements passed to Robin Weber, wrapped up a 24-23 victory and a national championship for Notre Dame. Seven years previously, against Michigan State, Another battle for the national championship had turned out differently. With the game tied at 10, Corsegian made a decision that he would never live down. Rather than risk the national championship, he ran out the clock and settled for a tie. There was so much attention focused on that game that the people wanted a conclusion to the game, and it didn't happen. I think we were heaped with too much criticism in that game and probably uh, too many accolades in others. The ups and downs of 11 seasons finally got to Araporsegian. Notre Dame is such a pressure-packed job. You, know, you, you, you can't relax after the game. Look on the sidelines and say, my God, he's, you know, he's looking older. By the end of 1974, Hara could go no further. I could recount it by memory of his retirement more than vision because I think I was pretty teary-eyed and I wasn't alone. We were all four grown men, we all cried. The tension that mounted within me on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday mornings became an unbearable experience. But you know, you look in the coaching profession, you start counting it on one hand, the number of college coaches, the number of professional coaches that have been able to bow out gracefully not very many. In Parsegian's last game, Notre Dame upset Alabama 13 to 11 to win the Orange Bowl. His coaching career was over for good at the age of 50. And at Notre Dame, only Newt Rockney has more wins as Ara bowed out of the game ever so gracefully. Programs, get your Notre Dame programs Each here. game day at Notre programs. Dame is much like the hundreds that have Dame preceded it. Here. Thing to do isn't to punch them, isn't to talk to them. There's only one way you get respect, and that's by looking somebody in the eye for 60 minutes. Go out there, hitch up your trousers and say, hey, baby, here I am now. Let me see you run through me now. Let me see you show some disrespect for me while I'm nose on your nose. 
Let me see what you think of me now that my face is to you. We talk about respect. We're talking about respect around the country. There's one thing that we want more than anything else, and that's respect. Let's go. Give me a left. 25 in. Hey, check that, check that. Split left, 91. The spirit of Notre Dame is more than yellowed newspaper clippings and flickering newsreels. It is kept fresh and vibrant by kids from all over America who come to South Bend to live out their dreams. A 51-yard boot. This is the ball game. The kick is up. It is! The spirit is not a figment of the imagination. It is real, binding forever, past to present, and all those who have felt it. The spirit is so unique, it's clean. It's one of the cleanest things we've got left. Maybe it's all a myth. Maybe those things never really happened, but you get the sense that they were real. It's just something you just can't define. But when you put that Notre Dame jersey on, and you run out there in Rocky Stadium, you know what it is, and you play for it.